pounds, man. <laughs> Get out of the banks. You know, uh, you think about it sometimes and you can rejoice in the fact that you get to see some of the loved ones that are assembled around that throne and you think about all that and that does bring me a lot of consolation. But then when I think about the coronation day, when Jesus Christ is crowned King of Kings, you know, I think all we're going to do is just be pointing at him over there. There he is. There he is. The one we've been talking about and preaching about and praying to and singing about and reading about. There He is. The kings of this earth are sovereign, but He's omnipotent. I tell our people in our church about God. It takes the Lord just as much power to pick up this piece of paper as it will for Him to destroy the Antichrist and all of that. He's omnipotent. That passage in Revelation where it says uh, when he destroys the devil, it simply says the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire where the beast and false prophet are. No big deal. It's like he goes. (laughs) So when you have struggles and problems and all those kind of things, the Lord's going to take care of this stuff. He's got it. You know, so uh, we don't get to see the battle always won down here, but we're on the winning side. And he's going to come back in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. We know that he's coming back. And that brings great comfort. And I'm looking for the coming of Jesus Christ, looking for that blessed hope, the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile bodies, that it may be fashioned like unto His glorious body, according to the working whereby He is able even to subdue all things unto Himself. It's going to be a great day, man. You know, I tell you what, it would be great if the Lord would go ahead and come back right now. He could... I could give the introduction, and He could give the conclusion. Let me tell you something. The Lord knows how to give a conclusion. He can close the thing down. He can shut it down. They had the big shutdown a few years ago. You hadn't seen nothing yet. He's going to shut this thing down. And they'll bow to knee one day, so it's all right. Let them have their fun now. And You know, if you're, if you're saved, this is all of hell you're going to see. Now, if you're not saved, this is all of heaven you're going to see. But I thank God I'm saved. And I thank God not only am I saved, I can't lose it. If I could lose my salvation, and I want to say this about you too, if you could lose your salvation, you would have already lost it. So, all right, let's go ahead and get into the text. Nehemiah chapter 2, appreciate the singing, appreciate the participation, our piano player, Brother Jay, all the leaders, everyone that has put a lot of hard work into this. Nehemiah chapter number 2. Let's go ahead and go to prayer. Brother Stevenson, you mind praying for us, brother?
Amen. Thank you so much. Verse number 17, the Bible says, Then said I unto them, <coughs> You see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lieth waste, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Come and let us build up the wall of Jerusalem, that we be no more a reproach. Then I told them of the hand of my God, which was good upon me, and also the king's words that he had spoken unto me. And they said, Let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for this good work. But when Sanballat the Horonite, and Tobiah the servant the Ammonite, and Geshem the Arabian heard it, they laughed us to scorn, and despised us, and said, What is this thing that ye do? Will ye rebel against the king? Then answered I them, and said unto them, The God of heaven, he will prosper us. Therefore we his servants will arise and build. But ye have no portion, nor right, nor memorial in Jerusalem." Yesterday, we began by looking at the condition of your place of fellowship. And by way of review, Jerusalem is that very special place in the Temple Mount where God's temple is. <clears throat> and inside of that temple where the Holy of Holies is, is that very special place where God met with His people in Old Testament times. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit and your fellowship with Jesus Christ is... A, lot, a large part dependent on you. He does not change. He's the same. He will fellowship with us if we open the door. He will fellowship with us if we meet the criteria and do the things that are pleasing in His sight. Now, we talked some yesterday about the condition of your place. You know, uh, the condition is in ruin and in need of repair. And I think we were a little bit honest last night. I hope you were. To where you might could look inside and see some areas where some gates are maybe uh, off their hinges and not locking and maybe some places in the wall that's been busted through where some things can get in and maybe there's some rubbish and some stuff in there that really doesn't need to be there. I hope you were honest last night about the condition of your place. You know, uh, we don't need revival. We don't need revival. We need repairable. Repairable. We need to make some repairs. And so since we see the need, this is what we do next. And here in the text, Nehemiah gets here, and he's already looked at everything, and he sees what's going on, and he says, look, let's get up here and build. And he's ready to begin the construction and the rebuilding process. So today we're going to look at the construction of your place. The construction of your place. So in verses 17 and 18, here's the thing I want you to understand. Number one, when you get ready to do this, you have to be determined. You have to be determined. This kind of bleeds in from yesterday. Nehemiah had a made up mind. I'm telling you, some of you, I don't know if somebody said the water was cold out there. You know, when you deal with cold water down in Florida, Pastor Kent Gene knows he's been to some of our springs down in our great county. Those springs come up, and it's hot outside, but those springs are like 65 degrees. And the best way to do those things, you don't go over there and tiptoe around the tulips and stick your little toe in there and see if you can, you just jump right in. And some of you, you just need to go ahead and make up your mind and cross the line and be determined. Nehemiah was determined, and he made up his mind. Now, Verses 17 and 18, you can see it here, and he's not backing down, and he's ready to build, and he's got God's hand on him, and he says, let us rise up and build, and they strengthen their hands for this good work. It's kind of like David, you know, he encouraged himself in the Lord his God, and here Nehemiah is determined because there are many obstacles. If you're not determined, it's not going to take much to get you to quit. We're talking about this wall that goes around the city. Now, I'm not sure. I don't have the circumference. You can look it up and study the old city walls and probably get the circumference of it and those kind of things. But walls would build the uh, cities would build the walls around the city for protection. And that's one of the first things they would need to do because they had to protect what they already had. If you don't have the walls of protection around you, and those are some immediate repairs that have to be done, then what will happen is what little bit of good that you had is going to be robbed and stolen away. What little good of success and what little good of progress you've made, you're going to go right back. 
you have to have the walls of protection. But I'm telling you, there's going to be a lot of obstacles. You've got to make up your mind. This is not for the faint-hearted. And you might be here and you might be marching around Zion today like we did, but you know it's easy to do that in here. There's some good, positive peer pressure. That's good. I like it. Boy, when it's out there and it's just you against the world and everybody that works with you is unbelievers, everybody that goes to school with you are unbelievers, maybe even people in your family, people that are close to you are going against what you're trying to do for God, you have got to be determined. It's a good place up here on the mountain to make up your mind. You can kind of do like uh, over there where Samuel had the Ebenezer stone. It's a memorial. And you can write down, hey, I've made up my mind. I'm, I'm building that wall. I'm going to make up those breaches there. There's a realization, verse number 17, about the condition which we saw. I think Nehemiah knew that building is the only option. He looks around and he says, you know what? It can only go up from here. <laughs> I mean, think about it. It's in disrepair. And the only option is to build. The only option is to repair. You know, when you think about all, trans, all modes of transportation, the, um, the, the horse and buggy, and then the, even the trains, and the automobiles, and even the big um, uh, battleships, they can go and they can stop. And they have reverses. They can take those horses and they can back those things up. Those... those uh, Locomotives, they can go backwards. Cars can go backwards. Everything can go backwards except airplanes. Now, if your airplane stops in the middle of the air, you got some problems. What you need with the laws of physics with those airplanes, you can't lose momentum and forward drive. You have to have forward, listen, and upward motion. Forward and upward motion. Paul says, forgetting those things that are behind and reaching forth unto the mark. I press forward, he says, for the prize and the high calling of God. If you just stand around and look at the debris, the, the debris and you stand around and look at the gates all broken down, and you stand around and just look at the sin in your life and the rubbish in your life, that's not going to do anything. You've got to make some progress. Maybe take one thing and tackle that one thing. Deal with it. You know, Jesus said this one thing. He says, you aren't far from the kingdom of God. A lot of times it's one little hang up. And if you'll deal with that one hang up, you can make some progress. There's got to be a realization. Next, there's got to be exhortation in verse number 18. If you're going to be determined, you've got to encourage yourself and each other. Uh, Nehemiah says, look, I told them of the hand of my God, which was good upon me. And they said, let us rise up and build. You have to realize, there's some folks that have been living there in that deplorable condition. They had no vision to build. Nehemiah comes around and he stirs the people up. And he says, hey, God's with me and God's in this thing and I believe God can do it. And they said, okay, well, let's do it then. There's exhortation. Hey, I believe in good, hard preaching, but sometimes you don't need harsh preaching. Sometimes you need some exhortation. Preach the Word, he tells Timothy. Reprove, rebuke, exhort. Sometimes you need a pat on the back. Now, I'm not going to pat you on the back all the time. A lot of times when people start rubbing you on the back, they're looking for a place to stick a knife. So be careful of everybody that's patting you on the back all the time. However, when you see somebody doing good and they're starting to come to church more and... And uh, sometimes some of my church members will say, hey, pastor, I just finished reading through my Bible. And they'll tell me those kind of things. Man, that encourages me. And I'm like, man, praise the Lord, that's great. I don't put a whole bunch of pressure on people. I preach about it. I talk about it. And sometimes they'll just casually say, hey, I just finished up my Bible. You know? And that, that encourages me. And I try to encourage them and say, hey, that's great. People make it back on Sunday night. They come every night of the revival. We say, hey, man, we're glad you made it every night. People go out to pass out tracts and do public ministry. Hey, thank the Lord you're here. Hey, that's a good thing that you're here. Hey, you've made some progress and you've done some good things for God's glory. Exhort, exhortation. That encourages you. 
you know, Nehemiah, he had evaluation which led to examination which led to exhortation. And this is all because of faith and hope. Faith and hope. Nehemiah was a great leader. There's a whole other story. We could just study Nehemiah. He is a leader of leaders. Somebody said leadership is the art of getting people to do what they ought to do because they want to do it. These people, they really wanted to build. They were there. They were the remnant. They had come back. But they had been defeated. Maybe they got outnumbered. Maybe they didn't count the cost. Whatever it was. They wanted to have a great wall. They wanted to have their own society. They wanted to kick out the bad people and and bring in the good things. They just needed some leadership. You've got to be determined because there's many obstacles. Number two, notice verses 19 through 20. You're going to have to be defiant. You're going to have to be defiant because there's much opposition. You're going to have to be defiant because there's much opposition. They're all excited. Verse 18, they strengthen their hands for this good work. They get the tool belts out. They charge up their cordless drills. They get everything ready, you know, they're all excited. Some of the ladies made some peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Amen. I don't know if y'all eat those out here or not. I grew up eating it. When I was a kid, we'd have those go to school. You know, we had these little tin, mail, uh, tin uh, lunch boxes. Hey, Amen. I got a witness somewhere. I think I had a Dukes of Hazard lunch box or something. <laughs> you know, superhero, Superman lunch box. And you carry peanut butter and jelly every day to school. And then what you do in your mind, you can imagine whatever you want to eat, and you eat it, and it kind of turns into that. You know, that's just what you do. (laughs) 30 years later, you go to your mom and dad's house, and you're rummaging through some old stuff, and you find your old baseball cards and your old Star Wars toys, and there's your old lunchbox. You open it up, it still smells like peanut butter and jelly. (laughs) Man, that stuff will stick to you. Hey, all you need is a little peanut butter, and you can get outside and just work all day long. Some peanut butter and water, man. You're good to go. They're ready. They're ready to go. They're strengthened. They got some energy. But here comes the opposition. Verse number 19, Sanballat the Horonite, Tobiah the servant, the Ammonite, Geshem the Arabian. They laughed them to scorn. Notice the confrontation. Verse 19, there will be confrontation. Just go ahead and accept that. People will laugh at you. It's going to happen. Jesus said, the world hated me, they're going to hate you. What you want to do, you want to make sure that when they're mocking and making fun of you, they're doing it because of the love of Christ that you have. Not because you're being crazy. You know, sometimes we do stupid things and we get stupid responses back. But when you're doing right, you can just almost halfway... Try to live a good Christian life and they're going to make fun of you. Just carry your Bible with you somewhere and you're going to be an oddball. Just bow your head and pray over your meal and you're going to look like some religious fanatic to people. There will be confrontation. You're going to have to have a little bit of defiant spirit. Not this bad attitude to where you're trying to pick a fight with everybody, but a little bit of grit. It says, you know what? God saved me, and I'm not going to turn my back on Him just because some little panty waist laughed at me and mocked at me and made fun of me. My Savior was laughed at, and a lot of our goodly heritage that came before us were mocked and made fun of. You can take a little bit of scorning. There's going to be some confrontation. Now notice another thing, you're going to have to be defiant because of the opposition, but verse number 20 is going to have to take place somewhere if you're going to construct this wall and protect that place of fellowship in your life. Verse number 20, there's going to have to be some separation. There's going to have to be some separation. You know, nowadays the idea of church is come as you are and leave as you came. We want you to come as you are and leave better than you can. But there's some things and some people you're going to have to separate from. 
And some of it, especially in this age, the devil is real good. He's always been good at it, but he's kind of been working at it a long time. He's amalgamated this world system into the very fabric of how you have to operate from a day-to-day basis. You're all tied into technology. And to some degree, you can't get away from it. And you're going to have to draw the line in defiance with certain things. A preacher friend of mine, he is a computer engineer for a school system. He's been doing that for years. And when he studies for his messages, he's got his office at his house. You know what's in his office? Nothing electronic. He deals with it all day long. I tell our people, you know, everybody won't see screens. I tell our folks, look, you go to work, you got screens. You get in your car, you got screens. You get in your pocket, you got a screen. You go in your living room and you got an altar to your screen. Everywhere you go, you got a screen. Why don't you come to church and just get a book? Let's open up the words of this book. There's some things in this world you're just going to have to be defiant with. And look, this is nothing new. This is nothing new. There were Christians in other generations that they had to make some hard calls with things in their life regarding separation. So preacher, I really want to have a closer walk with Jesus. Well, there's some things in your life that are not going to be compatible with Jesus. You ever read about the burning bush with Moses? That bush is burning and it catches Moses' attention. And it's burning, which was not a real um, anomaly because sometimes you have brush fires and different things with lightning storms and so so forth that take place, especially in parched land out here. You know, I hope nobody throws a cigarette butt. hope you're not smoking, but hope nobody throws a cigarette butt down. Man, I'm driving around here. It looks like desert everywhere. Where I'm from, everything is green. And there's lizards and crocodiles everywhere. My little dog, she catches lizards all the time, man. And she'll catch them, bring them in the house, roll on them. But this is desert land. And you could see some fires and different things at start, but Moses saw that thing and it didn't burn out. And that caught his eye and he was, he was curious about that thing. So he drew close to it, but when he got close, God said, take your shoes off. Preacher, I want to build a wall. I want to have a nice place of fellowship. I want Jesus to be welcome. I want to have a good relationship with Jesus. Well, take your shoes off. You're going to have to be defiant. You're going to have to say there's some things I've got to separate from. There's some people I've got to separate from. You're going to have to take your shoes off. And if you're not willing to do that, the enemy is going to sit down right beside you. So I'm going to read my Bible. Well, the devil will sit down right beside you. Some of you got your phone sitting there and you're trying to read your Bible and bing, 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 bing. You need to be listening to the Lord as you read the verses. Bing, bing. A lot of people, the first thing they do in the morning is grab that. I don't know why I'm preaching this. Maybe you don't have a problem with it. But typically speaking, a lot of people have a problem with it. Because they have mastered the whole technology deal to increase addictive behavior with it. That is not a secret. It is highly addictive. And a lot of the things on that garbage are highly addictive. And so it calls you. That's just one thing. We could talk about all kinds of stuff. Confrontation, separation, inspiration. Nineteen and twenty there he says, Hey, verse number twenty, the God of heaven, he will prosper us. Therefore we his servants will arise and build. But you have no portion nor right nor memorial in Jerusalem. Defiant. Make fun all you want. Go ahead, make fun. God's gonna prosper us. God's gonna bless us because God told us to do it. God told us all they that live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. So if God told us to live godly, by His grace, I'm going to try to live godly. Be defiant. You ever play tug of war? Y'all do know what tug of war is? Y'all done that before? You get on either side and you start pulling, you know? Well, here's the way to really get people riled up. I don't know if y'all use this term. Start talking smack. Smack. 
Y'all, y'all use that term smack, start talking smack. Yeah. You little girl, man, you can't pull nothing. What's going on with you? Man, your wrists are no bigger than the uh, wrist of a little roach. Man, you can't pull that thing. But you know what that what'll happen a lot of times? I remember like playing ball as a kid, and you're up there getting ready to bat, and all the people out there making fun of you. You can't hit the ball, man. You're just like, come on, man, send that thing. Point to the fence. It just does something to you on the inside. It ought to rile you up on the inside. It ought to bring some inspiration. Back in 2001, when we had the horrific September 11th incident, um, a few days into things, when it was getting really bad as far as rescues and things like that go, it's right around the time when that seventh tower was about to fall. And they sent out an evacuation order for all the firemen that were working right then. It was like, okay, you gotta, everybody's got to evacuate right now. This thing's about to fall. There was a fireman <clears throat> that spotted a flag in a, a boat that was docked. And a bunch of debris was all over that American flag. And he ran over there and grabbed that flag. And he got some help from some buddies. And they propped it on a, on a pole that was sticking out about 40 or 50 feet from the ground. They plopped that American flag up there and let it droop down. Y'all remember seeing that? Yeah. Somebody snapped a picture of that thing right when it happened. It was right at one of the blackest moments right after all that had happened and there was a little bit of spark of inspiration. The devil wants to push you down by mocking and by scoring and you need to take that and use that Aikido move and take that momentum and just turn it around and put it right back on it. So hey, God called us to do this. All this rubbish, all this rubble down here, we're going to pick through the pieces and we're going to build this wall. You're going to have to be defiant because of much opposition. Number three, and finally, chapter three, you're going to have to be diligent. You're going to have to be diligent because there's much needed organization. You're going to have to be diligent because there's much needed organization. Remember I told you this thing was a discipline deal. Building this wall and doing this hard work, this spiritual exercise. Paul talks about having your senses exercised to discern both good and evil. This isn't just some, you know, you read your little devotional in five minutes in the morning type of deal. This is a thing where there's a lot of introspection that goes on, a lot of evaluation that goes on, a lot of interrogation that goes on on the inside. And then you've got the encouragement, you've got the exhortation and all those kind of things. And so you've got to realize you've got to have some type of organization and you're going to have to be diligent. There's some necessary steps that you're going to have to make. The Christian life is a marathon. It is not a sprint. Some of you only been saved a little while. Man, that is great. I love to see new Christians. We had a guy last year, he was, I think he's 69 or 70. Might have right, be right, right at 70 that got saved. And I baptized him. And I've had a few older people that I've been able to, to baptize. It's a rare thing. Live their whole life without Christ and get saved. And I love to see new believers. But here's the thing. You're going to have to learn patience. It's just like you young married couple. Where's the new, there's a newlyweds over there? Where's the newlyweds? Somebody said newlyweds? Okay, very good. Praise the Lord. You can't start off where your grandparents ended. You just got to start off right now and you got to be patient. And it's the same way in your Christian life. You got to be patient with the Lord. You got to be patient with some of the brethren. You got to be patient, listen, with yourself. You're not going to attend church for two months and be able to master uh-huh. all of the doctrines That's right. that the pastors are teaching in the churches. That's not going to happen. No. Right. Here a little, there a little. Yeah. Line upon line. Precept oh, upon precept. Right. You need to enjoy the milk of the Word. I will say this, we should all enjoy the milk of the yes. Word. Right. Hey man, I like a good deep steak. Hey, I even like some of the weird stuff. 
I don't get up and preach a lot of the weird stuff because it's so, it's so much gray areas in there. You know, the grays. <laughs> the grays in the gray area. <laughs> but look, I like the meat, but you know, we all need some milk. Get you some milk and a good Oreo cookie. Best way to eat that Oreo cookie, in my opinion, you put it in your mouth, just let it dissolve. And you wash it down with some coffee. But look, if you're a new believer in here, you got to realize a Christian life is a marathon. It's not a sprint. Just start off and, and chew a little bit. Little babies in here, you don't start shoving food down their mouth. They start off and they have just the uh, whatever type of food they have that's, that's just puree type. And then they work and work up to things. Now, notice all the work that's going to take place. Flip over real quick to chapter 4. Look in verse number 2. You're going to have to be diligent because there's going to be needed organization. Because there's a process to doing things. Look in verse number 2. And he spake before his brethren the army of Samaria and said, What do these feeble Jews, will they fortify themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they make an end in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of the rubbish which are burned? You see how rubbish is mentioned? You see it again in verse 10. Judah said, The strength of the bearers of burdens is decayed, and there is much rubbish, so that we are not able to build the wall. So first, in your diligence, there's going to have to be excavation. Excavation. You're going to have to remove some rubbish. This is work. There's going to be some rubbish, some trash that's there. This is real similar to the point on separation, but I think this goes a little deeper. This isn't just necessarily the outside influences that you have to deal with. These, this is all the rubbish that's already inside. Yeah, that's real good. And see, it's been there for a while, and it's, it's in layers. Yes. And you've got to peel back a layer, and you think you're doing good, kind of like peeling an onion. And as you cry, you peel back the next layer. You shed some more tears and peel back another layer. And it's layer after layer. You can't just start building the wall on top of the rubbish. I read about a, uh, a city. It was like, you know how these neighborhoods pop up overnight. The developer buys the land. They come in. They set the crews up. They get to build it. I read about a neighborhood that it was built on a landfill. And they came through, they brought in some dirt, they brought in the impaction equipment and did, you know, some of the regulation stuff to get the ground in, you know, how they can build mountain out of nothing. And they built the thing out and then they got going. Well, it wasn't too many years that foundations began to settle. And they started to have cracks in their foundations. And then the, the streets began to crumble. Big holes and big sinkholes and people's houses falling in these big holes and all kind of stuff. I think the whole thing was eventually um, declared, uh, you know how they declare it unlivable. What's it called? Unsafe. Unsafe and things. So you've got to remove all the rubbish before you start building. There's some sins that we've allowed to take root. You know, the Bible speaks of some of these roots and one of them is the root of bitterness. Yes. The gall of iniquity. You know, lust can be a big root, especially for some of you guys in here. It can be a, a root that gets a hold of you, and you're going to have to deep down dig and get out some of this rubbish Amen. and examine your life. It's work. Put on your gloves. Put on your work boots. Don't wear your Crocs out there. You ever step on a nail? I've stepped on a few nails in my life. That's not very fun. Thank the Lord, one time I stepped in on down and it went right between my toes. It came out the top of my shoe. I was like, praise the Lord. And I was like, man, I better put on some boots. Yes. You step on a nail, then if you don't have a tetanus shot, you're off to the emergency room. And you get to look at a needle about this long. Put on the gloves and work. There's one guy who says, you know what, I like work. It fascinates me. I can sit and look at it for hours. <laughs> That's how a lot of Christians are. They can sit and watch all these other Christians ex excavate. And all these other Christians dig deep and, and pray and get things out of their life and come to the altar and get close to God and they can sit and just watch everybody else work. You know, a lot of times in churches and in organizations, 
20% of the people typically do 80% of the work. Yes. Typically. That's the general rule. You know, John the Baptist, when he came, he had a special commission. And that special commission was to prepare the way for Jesus. If the inside of you where the Holy Spirit dwells is that place where Jesus wants to be welcomed, then it's our job to prepare the way. Malachi chapter 3, prepare the way before me, he says. Isaiah 40, the passage on John the Baptist commission. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley should be exalted, every mountain and hill should be made low, and the crooked should be made straight, and the rough places plain, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. Do you want the glory of God in your heart? Do you want the Lord to feel welcome in your heart? Well, you're going to have to remove the rubbish. You're going to have to prepare the way. You're going to have to straighten up. That's what he says. You've got to make the crooked straight. Some things are going to have to be straightened up. He says that you're going to have to fill some things up. You're going to have to fill up those places to get the foundation prepared. Some of you have a lot of holes in your foundation. You've got to fill it up with the right thing. You know, the one mistake a lot of people make is they remove the rubbish, but then they don't replace the rubbish. Repentance is always two parts. Repentance is from and to. Repentance is, you can sim- simply define it like this. Repentance is replacing the rubbish. Okay. Repentance is replacing the rubbish. If you say, okay, I'm going to get rid of all this stuff. Yeah. You know what's going to happen? You're going to have a dry place. Yes. And those spirits are going to come around. Yeah. And it's going to be empty, swept, and garnished. And you're going to become some self-righteous Pharisee. Yeah. And you're going to be filled up with other wicked spirits more wicked than the other sins that you had before. You better get filled up on the Word of God and be filled with the Spirit of God. And there's some things you're going to have to bring down in this excavation process. He said the valley's going to have to be, uh, the mountain's going to have to be brought down. The valley's going to have to be brought up. You've got to smooth out. In the New Testament, he uses that word smooth out. There's some areas that are going to have to be made plain. It made smooth. So we have excavation, which leads to what? Foundation. 1 Corinthians 3.11, you probably know the verse. For other foundation can no man lay, and that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. You know, if you look all through Nehemiah, there's no new material needed. You've got everything you need right here. Look, I'm all about devotionals and Bible studies and writing books and reading extra books and I read and write and all that kind of stuff. But this, this, this is your material right here. This is it. You can't replace you and your Bible. No new material was needed. Foundation, they have to lay it. Then there's implementation. In chapter 3, we can't go through the whole thing. If you've ever read through it before, it kinda, it's kind of redundant, you think, as you read through. And you're like, what is, what is all this stuff going on? And you go through it, and he talks about him building on this wall, and he's setting up this gate, and this family's doing this, and this family's doing that. You'll keep noticing over and over the, this thing as you go through, you begin to see these words pop up. And you'll notice, uh, and we'll see it in verse number 4, next unto them. Verse 5, next unto them. Verse 7, next unto them. Next unto them. All throughout this thing, and you get down, and you keep going through, and you say, what is all this here for? How do you implement this? Say, preacher, I want to remove the rubbish, and I want to begin to excavate, and then I want to begin to lay the foundation. How can I implement this? Well, there has to be consistency. Consistency. Don't stop working. What you'll see as we get into this thing next, next uh, sermon, they don't stop at nighttime. You got this 24-hour thing going on and some of them's working and some of them's holding the sword and some of them's watching, some of them's working, some of them's building, some of them's battling. This whole thing is consistent. So preacher, I came to church last month. I don't need to come this month. No, you need to be in church every time the doors are open. I read my Bible yesterday. Well, you need to read it today. I prayed last week. No, you need to pray 
every day. You need to pray multiple times a day. You know, David mentions morning, noon, at night. That's a pretty good idea. Consistency. So, well, that's just not my nature. That's just not my character. There's a lot of excuses with Christians. You ever read the book of Proverbs? Why on God's green earth would He write the book of Proverbs if there are certain things in your nature that you can't change? Because He tells you over and over in Proverbs about certain characteristics and about changing those characteristics. Well, the only thing I'm consistent about is being inconsistent. No, you're just lazy and you need to change. And if you're going to build a wall and you're going to make this place a special place for Jesus Christ, you're going to have to be consistent. Number two, cooperation. Verse number 18, well, all the way through here, really. Notice in verse 18, it mentions their brethren. There's something about having other people in the fight with you. Now, we're talking about individual fellowship this week, but there's also corporate fellowship. And we see even with Nehemiah, he doesn't get there and he can't do it by himself. He's got the vision and he's a leader, but as he begins to stir up the people, he needs everybody that's there to get involved. Appreciate what you were saying, Brother Jay, about the whole camp moving as a whole. And I know at least for a lot of Americans... It's a hard mentality because we're so individualistic. But God still says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is. You need to have brothers and sisters in Christ. You need to be in church. There was this lady and she was doing her vacation Bible school or Sunday school class. And right toward the end of the class, a new student came in. And she noticed right off the bat something was wrong with him. He was missing an arm. He only had one arm. And so she was thinking, oh, how am I going to divert this and not so the other kids, you know how kids are, they're real kind, you know, they all make fun, you know how kids are. (laughs) What's wrong with your arm? How come you don't have an arm? You know how they are. Um, So she was thinking, how is she going to do this? And uh, so she was glad it was kind of toward the end of the class. He came in late. And so she just went on, did the normal things that she did right toward the end of the class. And they always, right at the end of the class, they make, they do their little church thing. You know, here's the church. Here's the steeple opening up, and there's the people. And of course, right when she said, let's do the church, she, remember, she thought about the error of her ways because he only has one hand. How's he going to do the little church and the steeple thing? Well, a little girl went over there beside him, and he only had a left arm, and she took her right arm, and she said, hey, let's do church together. That's a good thing, you know? Hey, let's do church together. You're working on your own individual relationship, but there's somebody else working on theirs too. That can encourage you. Hey, if they're making some progress and they're getting rid of some junk and they're building a good foundation, maybe you can build a good foundation. Hey, and maybe you can say, hey, can you pray for me? You don't have to necessarily put out your dirty laundry everywhere. You can say, hey, I've got an unspoken, but it's got to do with this stuff I'm dealing with. Can you pray for me? I guarantee you they'll pray for you. Cooperation, consistency, continuity. Next, next, next. After him, verse number 20. After him, you see that thing over and over. There are some things in your Christian life you've got to build now, and then you build upon those things. You start with the foundation, and then you work your way up. Some things are only going to come later. And there's an order to things. I think a lot of Christians get discouraged especially if they're maybe more toward the intellectual level and they're used to academics and you know, they want to learn something and they want to get it. And they're like, okay, I want to learn everything about the Baptist. Why don't you just fall in love with Jesus first? Amen. Just fall in love with Jesus. You can learn some of this stuff here and there, but let's work on your foundation, Jesus Christ. And then build and build and build. Finally, It's not just continuity and cooperation and consistency. This is all dealing with how to implement this. There's the commissions. There's the commissions. You'll notice all these different names are given, all these different families. And the reason that's given in chapter 3 is because they have different responsibilities. I mean, unity and diversity, that's what a university is supposed to be, right? (laughs) Really, the body of Christ is true university. Because here we are from all different backgrounds. 
We're all in our own little places and we have our own little place of fellowship with Jesus, but we're all in this as one corporate body. Notice they have a different thing. You'll notice the fish gate, verse number 3, the sons of Hassanei built. You'll notice in verse number 4, next unto them repaired Merimoth, the son of Urijah, the son of Koz. And it goes on through there. And you'll see different people, different families lifted, listed, different gates are given. 10 to 12 different gates are listed. And all these things are important. You're going to see three words in this whole list in Nehemiah 3, you're going to see the word build. You'll see that popping up over and over. Some things are going to have to be built. Then you're going to see the word fortify. Now what's the difference in building something and fortify? Well, building something, you grab your boards and you grab your stuff and you kind of get on that foundation and you start from scratch and build. To fortify something, you already have the structure, but maybe it just needs to be shored up a little bit. So you run a cross piece across and you, you put a supporting piece on it and you fortify it. Amen. Some of you, you've, got some, you've already got a good foundation. And you've got some things you don't even realize it. You don't have to start over from scratch. You need to build upon those things. What does it say? If any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones. Some of you, there's some areas in your life you need to fortify. And then, of course, the main one, the repair. It's used the most. There's a lot of repair. You know, you think about Christians... We are a broken group of people. The Lord uses broken things. Aren't you glad? I mean, Gideon took that, that, that vase and it had the light in there and you didn't see the light until they broke the vessel. It's the same thing when you get over there with the woman with the alabaster box. You couldn't smell the perfume and Jesus never would have been anointed so that fragrance was there even when He was being beat and that sweat and blood, that fragrance probably was still on him and that aroma of her sacrifice was there. So God was pleased with that sacrifice and she broke that box. Yes. And Paul and those disciples are on that ship and that thing breaks all the pieces. And here they come floating to land on broken boards. God uses broken things. And He will take your broken, disrepaired life He'll take those broken gates, those walls that are busted down, and He will repair those things. Hey man, He's in the soul restoration business. He's in the soul salvation business. But He can restore your soul. He can restore the years the locust hath eaten. Some of you have made some messes. Some of you quit working. Some of you, you were there and you didn't maybe have a leader. You didn't have any encouragement, so you just got used to the rubbish. Just put a clothespin on your nose and didn't worry about the smell. Just went on. But God wants you to repair that stuff and to start building it. And everybody's at a different place. Different gates. We don't have time to get into the significance of all the gates, but there's a biblical significance of all those gates, and what that points to, different areas in your life that you might need to be working on. You might need to be working on the fish gate. So what's that? You catch fish? No. Jesus said go out and be fishers of men. Right? The sheep gate. Pastoring. Or leading someone along. The water gate. There's all these different gates and all these different significance. And God, listen, and I'm done. God will have you at your place of fellowship. And that's your little spot. That's your little place in the wall that God's given you. And nobody else can do it for you. That's your spot with your problems. But God will give you all the tools you need to repair those things, to fortify and to build it and sure it up. So eventually you can have a wall of protection. So then the Lord can have liberty like He wants to have in your life. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank You for Your grace. I pray You'd bless now. Thank You for the Scriptures. Help us, Lord. We're all broken and we need repair. In Jesus' name, Amen.